team. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How was your weekend? Uh, mine was mine was uh, lovely. It Good. was on the shores of the Madawaska River. Mm, mine was doing chores at home. And I watched two small children, four small children then, chasing kites. Yes, lovely. It was lovely. Good. I'm glad. I did electrical work. <laughs> um, cool. Welcome. Uh, we I are hope, delighted to see you. Yeah, we hope the Wi-Fi improves um, this garbage signal, as, it, as I think somebody garbage was used. Yeah. But not today. It's been used. Yeah. Um, oh, trash. Yeah. Folks, um, so we we do our best not to like harp <clears throat> on things, and do you do you buy that? Yeah, <laughs> we try. Um, please wear masks like all the time. Yeah. Please, even if you've already had COVID, don't get it again. <laughs> um, the data are freaking terrible. Um, so about damage to immune systems and hearts and brains and all of that stuff. And there are things that you can do. Please dive into Google, into the good spaces on Google and get some good evidence and good information. And if we can be helpful with that, let us know. Um, uh, please. Okay. I'll stop. Um. I won't. That harp will come out again. <laughs> Yeah. Unos, dos, tres, cuatro. <laughs> so wear a mask, wear okay. a mask. It's uh, so simple, wear a mask. Okay, I'm going to uh, clear this. And, oh, wait, it didn't clear. There we go. Um, uh, today, we are going to dive into freeze intolerance and freeze tolerance uh, in a kind of roundabout, fun kind of way. We're going to talk about science. Wait, are we both sizing this? <laughs> Do you Isn't want to? Good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm so tired about the both sides thing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're going to do some stuff. We're going to talk about science. We're going to apply it to freeze intolerance and tolerance, and we're going to graph stuff, and it's going to be great. Um, if you're curled up in bed in your pajamas, just make sure that you have at least uh, a finger available to be able to click and do things, and that would be great. Okay. But first, the answer to the homework question. I'm sure you're sitting there, bated breath. Where is it? Let me just... Time scales and biological scales. Here we go. Okay, just another say, minute or so. We've got seventy percent have clicked in, so that's not that's not terrible at all.
Okay. Oh, 79%. Let's get it up to 80. Go, go, go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And pull. 51% of you got the correct answer. So well done. That's good. Uh, for those of you who did not get the correct answer, um, thanks for clicking in. If you guessed, no worries. Just go back and make sure that you understand it. Or if we can be of any help, please let us know. Um, and then for those who um, are thinking that they got the right answer, but they didn't, um, just make sure, just go back and take a look and figure out sort of which one was incorrect to match um, this uh, particular statement. So for A, um, which seems to be the second most popular answer, um, for A, the Arctic fox curls into a ball to reduce exposure. Um, that's an acute response or an acute kind of behavior or description of an adaptation to the cold. Um, uh, not something that's chronic, not something that kind of stays like that for weeks and weeks or months and months. Um, so there you go. And you can just kind of move through those. Um, and the other thing you can do, uh, of course, is for all of the, the incorrect ones, B, C, and D, figure out what the correct ones are um, in order to help studying and things like that. So there you go. So really, if you've got it wrong, you're ahead of the game. Yeah. Because you're already using it as a study tool. Flagged. Okay, good. <laughs> Yay. Okay. In today's class, semaphore. <laughs> nice. So, why don't fish freeze solid? Um, here's the problem. Here's the observation. <sighs> we should have brought up some fish sticks. <laughs> Damn it. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Here's your, here's your WTF moment in biology where you're uh, measuring water temperature in the high Arctic or the low Antarctic. Uh, and you realize that the temperature of the water is minus 1.8 or 1.9 degrees Celsius. Now, there's a problem because things that are freshwater, like fish, their bodies are freshwater, we are freshwater, um, uh, they uh, freeze, or the fluid freezes at like zero, right? Um, and so the question is, why don't fish freeze? Um, how, what are they doing in their bodies? And all of this, of course, is a physiological uh, answer. So um, some studies were done, um, but in order to do them, we kind of have to set it out, right? Remember, we're doing hypothesis and prediction and those types of things. So what's the observed pattern? There are fish swimming around in the sea that is really cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, what hypotheses could explain it? What predictions could we generate? How could you test these predictions? And how would our confidence in the hypothesis change um, as a result of these tests? So this is kind of the standard kind of template that you might go through as you're setting up some kind of experiment or trying to understand some kind of like strange observation like fish swimming around in water that should be freezing them. Right? Right. Good. So, some data were collected. And what we want to do is we kind of, we don't want to start at the beginning. We're going to kind of like start in the middle. So we're going to start with giving you already these data. And what we would love for you to do is give us <clears throat> two conclusions. Oh, you know what though? There's like Wi-Fi issues. There are. There are? Okay. So can you do it in the chat or like on the side here? Give us two conclusions that you can get from, uh, so don't go to the menti, two conclusions that you can get from looking at these data. So it's a bit more complex. You got this. Everybody go to the cat. Ooh, we're cool for cats. Mm -hmm.
And if you can't come up with two, drop one in there. Here they start to come. There we go. Hooray. Well done. All right. Well done. Okay. So there's some interesting uh, observations in terms of some interpretations of those. So as uh, the first one that popped up was as the plasma freezing point decreases, the concentration of antifreeze protein increases. Uh, the second observation was that colder temperatures cause increased antifreeze protein uh, production, which prevents freezing. High protein concentration during lowest freezing point. There's a biological response, uh, a generational adaptation. Uh, antifreeze production likely represents a generational adaptation. Colder temperatures cause increased... Yeah, just... Oh, you just read that one. Yes. Okay, super. Okay, wonderful. Good. So some of these are more accurate than others. It's true. I would say all of them are reasonable. Not all of them will be supported by us That's diving good. into the data. That's right. So all of them are reasonable. Thank you. Now, take a look for a second. or Make sure to orient yourself. Sometimes uh, people do this. This is kind of telling stories with graphs, right? And we talked about that way back in like I don't know September <laughs> who knows what year um, where we talked about telling stories efficiently and honestly with graphs and this is not dishonest but it is centering the story in this graph by starting the graph in September and sometimes that's you're like why would you do that and it's partially because of that nice u-shaped um, hump shaped just center it's centering the story on your graph it's yeah. not changing the data it's just orienting it Oh, thanks. That's good. Okay. So, yes, all of these are reasonable. Some of them take an yeah. extra step into inference, which is kind of what we want to talk about and uh, sort of emphasize that the more you do that, the more surprised you may be by your results. Is that fair? Okay. So here we go. Let's uh, let's take a look. So you talked about the uh, colder month, the more antifreeze proteins, lower temperatures cause the increase in antifreeze proteins, blah, blah, blah. So let's let's kind of like dive into that because uh, that's how we might interpret it biologically. Right. So the observation is that antifreeze proteins increase in fall <clears throat> and decrease in spring. And you've kind of dived in a little bit to go, well, it's probably going to be um, the cold temperatures, right? In cold water, marine fresh, the trigger for, for synthesis of antifreeze proteins is going to be cold because it's cold and it gets colder. And cold is related to not freezing. And so this all makes total sense, right, for the trigger. And so what is it? that's happening in that time to cause these these antifreeze proteins to increase. And most of you have talked about the cold temperature. Amazing. That would be the next step. So the next set of experiments that would come. And so let's think again, we're going to skip the mentee and we're just going to go into the chat if that's okay. So you want to test whether or not cold is the trigger for the change or the upregulation of antifreeze proteins, what do you do? Imagine that you have unlimited resources. Hooray! Hooray! What do you do? What What's your equipment like? What are you going to buy uh, and what are you going to set up? What's going to be your experimental design? Just, I have a machine that goes bing! <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about writing a comprehensive answer. Just throw something in the chat and then someone will build on it and by the end we'll have an experiment. You jumped off exposing certain species of fish to either of the two proteins. Okay, there we go. First of all, we need to buy fish. That's Sam. Sam draws a fish. Large tanks. Yeah. Put groups of fish into two different buckets of different water temperature. Yeah. Tank cold water. Good. Um, a bunch of captive fish and separate them into two tanks, one hot, one cold, and test blood concentrations at the end of five months. So time and condition. I love yep. it. Take one of those fishes, cool it in the summer. Okay. 
Put the fish in a cold environment, tag with colder water. Good. Keep temperature constant, see what happens. Nice. There's a control group. Thank you, Madigan. There we go. Yep. Yep. Good. We need to buy a tank for the fish first. True. Okay. How many tanks? Do you want just two tanks? Like what happens if something... Remember, you've got unlimited resources. Yeah. Do you want more than two tanks by any chance? Five, Five tanks. tanks. Fifty <laughs> tanks. Four <laughs> tanks. One, One million. One million. How many fish in a tank? <laughs> Wonderful. Have a control Four. variable similar to nature. Yeah. Lots, lots of fish in a tank. One actual tank. But twenty-five ponds. Oh, that's good. Label each tank and name each fish for sure. Samuel. Start fish empire. Perfect. Okay. So I hope I hope what this is showing is that there is no one experimental design. And this is the part that I absolutely love about science is that you can get so creative, right? I mean, some folks would even argue, why do we need a fish? That's just complicated. Let's just use the cells or the molecules of the fish, right? Oh, and those reductionist people. <laughs> or others would be like, why do we even need the cells? Let's just play around with their genes and like see if they're upregulated by whatever. And then other folks are like, my goodness, you can't do the gene thing. You have to do the 25 ponds because like everything else really matters. I'm kind of like the 25 pond person. Um, you're the 25 pond person too, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, right? Okay. So um, Actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm like going study it outside, but you can't really do it in this 25 case. 25 ponds. Yeah. That's, but, yeah, that's what's going to find 25 ponds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 25 yeah. naturally occurring ponds? That's right. Yeah, 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 with yeah. all of the fish. And we're going to look at their antifreeze proteins. Okay, so yes, there are so many different ways of setting up um, an experimental design. And that is the thing to be celebrated about science. Um, it is delightful. And I, when I kind of do my science, I like to see if I can figure out how I can come at the same problem in a couple of ways. Um, to see kind of whether they all agree or what we might learn from looking at it from a different perspective. I think it's also important to note that perhaps in your training as a person uh, by the school system so far, you might have, a, a false dichotomy might have been introduced to you. Almost certainly it has. I would suspect it has. That, that if you're creative, think about the arts. And if you're logical, think about the sciences. And it's like, mm, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highly, highly recruit from the creative pool yeah. for science. Yeah. And I know as a fact, lots of lots of artistic um, endeavors require the methodical kind of training that often you maybe think of or society tells you to think about it as, as a science. They're not two different silos. No. They need to cross pollinate. And that, that creativity comes in the experimental design as we're talking about. It comes in the expression of the graphs as, yeah. as we've talked about and even in the writing. Yep. Boo! Tangent. Yay, because science. Amazing. Okay, so some guys did some things, and here's what they did. Doesn't necessarily mean that it is perfect or accurate. Oh, the other thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox for one more second because I'm seeing a lot of this misinformation going around on Twitter these days. You do not, by default, have to have a double-blind, controlled experiment in a lab in order to be able to make conclusions about what's happening in the world. Otherwise, we would still not be wearing seatbelts. So just think about that for a second. Okay. Good questions in the, uh, how, how would a fish wear a sweater? How would a fish wear a sweater? <laughs> Please draw that. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we have is... Oh, fish. Buy fish for fish. The sweater. <laughs> the sweater. <laughs> I love it. And okay. as they wear them, are they on bicycles? Yeah. So, okay, temperature. Control group. 20 fish. So yay for those who talked about a control. In this case, it's perfectly reasonable to have a control. Uh, experimental group. So, so when is it not reasonable to have a control group or a treatment group? Um, you know, when, when we're... Oh, gosh. There are so many reasons. Like seatbelts. 
Like we're not going to put a whole bunch of people in cars with and without seatbelts and test whether or not the seatbelts work, right? So there are some times where it's just not ethical and we can take a look at like other sources of data to understand what reasonable policy is. But in this case, it would be reasonable um, to have a control group and an experimental group. Oh, I've got another one. Way back when we talked about the uh, presentation of data, there was a graph yeah. of chocolate and number of oh. Nobel Prizes. And it would be extremely unethical to strip one nation of, of their chocolate. chocolate. I agree. Like that, that's just not cool. No, the kids would cry. Okay. Um, in the experimental group, 20 fish. Why did they pick 20? Because... That was the, yeah, or the size of the tanks that they had, or the animal care protocol requirements, or the whatevers, right? Like, who, or maybe they had 30 fish and 10 died, right? So who knows what it is, but they had 20 fish, and that's okay. Um, for some reason, that whole, we see this a lot um, in um, undergrad thesis students that join our lab. For some reason, they have it, not, not for some reason, for a reason, they have it in their Training. head that they have to have 30 fish or else like it's not going to work and we're going to have to throw out our data. Do not, do not believe any of these conventions as being a golden rule that you can't, you know, deliberately and intentionally break because it's so fun to break them. Okay. Temperature is going to decrease by, by 1.5 degrees Celsius over time. Okay, so we're going to add a time element to this. So we're not just going to have two tanks and like, bam, you're cold. <laughs> um, and what, the, what we're going to do or what these guys did was they measured the plasma uh, antifreeze proteins over time. Um, and uh, now we can come up with some expected results. And this is such a powerful tool. Smith and I do this with our students. Um, every time that we're going to set up any kind of experiment or ask any kind of questions. Uh, we get our students to draw out the hypotheses um, and what the predictions might be if those hypotheses are supported. Show me a cartoon of what it's going to look a like. A cartoon, like an infographic. Yeah. So let's imagine that that is our experiment. We have control fish, we have experimental fish. Let's in blue draw what we might expect. So we're holding temperature stable. Antifreeze proteins are going to do what? Oh, that's, yeah, that's good. Somebody's up. Um, MC and Dav is noting in the chat that sample size for experiments and investigations involving live animals is discussed a lot in the animal user training yeah. Uh, module. Yeah. And it's true that those are some other ethical concerns. Yeah. Cool. Okay. What, what, sorry, which color were we crafting here? This was is blue. blue. Okay. This is blue. I this will is great. All of that is blue. All of this is blue. Yes. Okay. Now, red, if you please, uh, show us what you think we should see if the hypothesis is supported. Rouge. Oh. I love Zoom annotate. I love Zoom well annotate. Done. Yeah, me too. Wait, is that a fish in a sweater or a copepot in a sweater? I think it's a fish in a sweater. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sam's struggling with where to put the fins. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where I would put the fins. <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay. Super good. I'm going to have to delete this in a sec, Sam, so I don't want to. I feel so bad every time with all your drawings. Sorry, Danielle and Rachel. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is exactly what we might predict, right? And where exactly, you know, the origin of the line is going to be, who knows, but like we ask our students to come with these two lines to a meeting and we talk about them, right? Because it really helps us then understand the results when we see them. We can compare them, right? With our predictions and go, yay. Except for sometimes we can compare them with our predictions and go, what the flounder? What the flounder? And we look at our schedule and say, you know what? This five minute meeting, 10 minute meeting needs to be longer. Because this is what they actually got. Hmm. So hmm. what are we thinking? Like first response, you're a scientist. Put your student. first response in the chat. 
you look at your graph and you're like, what the flounder? What do you do? <laughs> They're lying. Okay. They're lying. <laughs> Okay, slow down. <laughs> the Cry. fish are lying. Cry. Yes. Add more fish. Okay. Uh oh, crap. Lower the temperature more. Okay. That's an inch up. Look for a different variable. Nice. Presume that it's, or conclude that it's not temperature that triggers. Yeah. Is it the, da 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 Design another experiment. Modify the experiment. Lower the temperature more. Give up. Give up. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so this is a terrifying moment, and it happens to every student of science, um, and it's really the pit of despair, right? You get this, you have a flat line across your graph, you're like, I am useless. Um, and it happens a lot. The other, oh, the other moment, and like, just keep this in mind if you're ever like, you know, pursuing any kind of career in science, whether it's writing about science or communicating science or doing science, you will find a paper that is named exactly, or an article that is named exactly what it is that you think you're doing, that has already been written. Um, and then you will read it, uh, first you will panic, and then you will read it and realize, no, I have important things to contribute and everything will be okay. But I have every, my towel. I don't need to panic. <laughs> every student has that moment too. And every student has this flat line graph moment. Yeah, and definitely don't pull a Mendel. That, yeah. That's, a, that's actually a very funny phrase about you, but uh, yeah. Pull a Mendel, yeah. like change your data. And I put don't. a link in there, the WTF, what we call what the flounder, what other people might call what the frack. <laughs> Um, oh, come on. You haven't sworn yet in this whole class. Really? Yeah. Do it. F bomb. All right. So I call it. So it is, it's a real thing. In fact, we have papers <laughs> and press about those papers where we just documented the what the fuck moment <laughs> where you are presenting and talking about uh, an expected conclusion. In this case, we were looking at pitcher plants in Algonquin Park, talking about the things that they eat. And I turn over the leaf of a pitcher plant and inside we see salamanders. Pitcher plants don't eat salamanders. This is a what the fuck moment. And then we have students who work on this kind of thing now because we, it was a discovery. This is a what the flounder moment. Yep, come up with a new hypothesis. So a mat, So I loved that you were like checking your temperature, that you yeah. were checking your fish, that you were gonna do it again. Yes, the answer is yes to all of those things. Yeah, it's kind right? of scaled, right? It's like, okay, did was it plugged in? Was <laughs> like doing doing like the the, the, the practical or the the pragmatic things first rule that because you yeah. don't want to rule those out right exactly and, and then you want to be like okay then the range of temperatures that was a good suggestion maybe we're not in the zone yet where something yeah. happens that's yeah, a good yeah, suggestion yeah. yeah and then and all open of your the, mind all of those things that you're gonna have to do are gonna kill your soul because you're <laughs> still gonna get a flat line okay and you have to it's the pit of despair you have to do it right I loved. Put on the Rocky soundtrack. Have like a train, a training <laughs> montage. It's the eye of the flounder. It's the blue. <laughs> and I loved the question about think of a new variable. Think of a new uh, hypothesis, yeah. right? Um, because it is entirely possible that here, yeah, the methods, no good. You had to check them. You're still going to get a flat line. It is going to kill your soul. Your spirit is going to be totally like deflated. Um, and so you need to then go, okay, th these are real results. What do we do next? So what do we do next? We think of another trigger. <laughs> what might that be? Let's go back. What might the other trigger be? <laughs> There's an observation made in the chat that all of this would assume that uh, they already have a soul, or still have a soul. <laughs> you have a soul. Yeah, it's there. Do. Okay. And there's some grip, the bam, bam, bam. Time of year, time of year, time of year, time of year. Circuit annual seasonal trigger. Wonderful. Roy Rogers wrote that all the time. <laughs> That's a joke for my dad, who's not in class today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Circadian uh, annual rhythm. Yes. So how do we, based on the x-axis, you said you said originally, a lot of you said originally it was temperature. What else changes seasonally that we can use as a variable to test whether or not that's the trigger? <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, sunlight. Amount of light. Light? Light. 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 Maybe sunlight. Food, salinity, daylight, day length, 
Daylight. <laughs> okay. Daylight. Good. Good. So, yes, and so it's not just one thing. All of the other things change, too. So you may not get straight to, you know, what's called photo period uh, right away. And so that's totally fine because it's reasonable. Um, and so imagine we try photo period. So photo period is the period of time in the day that it is light outside. Um, and so we have our control group, 20 fish again, and they are on a 12-hour light, 12-hour dark schedule. Okay, that's our control. Basically, they're Brazilian. <laughs> now, the experimental group there are three experimental groups. So this is different, right? This is not over time. This is three different tanks in three different rooms with different photo periods. One of them has a 10 hour light, 14 hour dark. The other has eight hour light, 16 hour dark. And the other has six hours light and eight hours dark. So basically Guelph, right, <laughs> right here. Okay. Okay. Temperature is constant for all the groups, so oh, it doesn't. Yeah, off right now. Yeah, it doesn't change over time. Uh, we're going to measure antifreeze proteins, and what I want you to do is to imagine in your brains what those data are going to look like as a bar graph. Okay. So bar graph it up in your head. Imagine you're going to have on the y-axis. Uh, antifreeze protein concentration on the x-axis you're going to have these four groups the control of 12 hour 12 hour then then the other three treatments stamp for me which one is going to if the prediction is true which one is going to have the highest bar on the bar graph Good. Okay. And then stamp for me which is going to have the lowest bar on the bar graph. Amazing. Okay, ready? So you're visualizing it in your head? <laughs> okay, good. Here we go. Here's what we've got. Is the hypothesis supported. Yes, no, give me a check mark or an X. <clears throat> Is it supported? Or express it in the cat. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. A, Excellent. A flurry of yeses. Yeses. Good. Good. Yes. It is supported. Is that the be all and end all? Do we now just like walk away and wrap up our careers? No. Millions more questions that come from this observation, but it's elegant and it worked. Yeah. And one of the observations was uh, show me a p value first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or um, an effect size. Mm hmm. Okay, so if you're into p-values, read up about effect sizes. Way more fun. Power! Okay. Power! Yeah. And then you get into questions about, is 20 fish enough? So, um, cool. Thank you. I hope that was interesting and fun. I think it is. I was interested in having fun the whole time. <laughs> awesome. Now, here's the big question. Why is it photo period and not temperature? Because it kind of seems obvious that it should be temperature. So why the flounder? Is it photo period that triggers an adaptation to the cold when it's really the cold, not the photo period that matters? It's messed up. So why? Any ideas? Any hypotheses? Should we ask them to generate hypotheses and then revisit them on Wednesday? Yeah. Or Will we could talk about it because yeah. we're not going to finish what we were planning. And that's okay. We have time. So why? Why did this 
So there's like approximate answer and an ultimate answer, right? The approximate answer is that light is a proxy for cold. So that works, right? But why did the trigger evolve to be photoperiod and not temperature? Yeah, there's some good thoughts in the chat. Uh, one of them, uh, I love that Jacob is that M Jacob 06 temperature is not 100% consistent. So I would think about expressing that from the sunlight, from the light, from the day length perspective. Yeah. That's temp fluctuates. Brilliant. Oh, and I love it. It's evolution. It ain't perfect. Perfect. Like delightful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Changes happen more gradually. Really good. Okay. You want to ensure that you're prepared for the cold before the cold comes. Ding! <laughs> yes. Uh, sharp 07. Temperature could fluctuate annually, but light follows the same pattern. Really good. Yep. Yep. For sure. So photo period is a more stable, more reliable, and anticipatory um, light affects temperature. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, but it's more of a, a, an anticipatory variable that fluctuates just in time, right? Um, you know, the days start to get darker before the temperature starts to get colder. So it allows your body, if it evolves, I mean, obviously these aren't being done consciously, but over time, the photo period would be the more stable and more predictive variable in order to prepare the body physi physiologically for a hardship that's coming up. So very well done. Yeah. So we talk about light as being, or photo period being an honest, a more honest signal upon which evolution yeah. can act because the signal that doesn't fluctuate daily. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or annually in the same, or predictably it does fluctuate yeah. annually. It's, it's predictable. It's honest. Whereas temperature, mm. last week it was 20 degrees. That was nice. That was, that, that's dishonest is my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so do you get that? Do you have any questions about that before we move? Because to me, like, that's awesome um, and really cool to think about how, you know, your triggers might be proxies <clears throat> for other things that are sort of less stable. And you you don't have to come up, we're not forcing you to come up with questions now no. because one of the things is we're going to revisit this uh, today we're going to talk about kind of ectothermic uh, vertebrates, but yeah. on Wednesday we're going to bring in some of the endotherms to class and uh, and we'll revisit some of this, okay. this signaling. Yeah. So think about this. When we think about freeze avoidance and freeze tolerance, right? A lot of these things have to do with photo period. Um, and... The other thing I think that we can introduce that we never really talk about is the idea of whether um, freeze tolerance is obligate versus facultative. Do you know those words? Have you heard those words? Obligate maybe you've heard before, maybe not facultative. Um, the idea that, so obligate means that you have to do something and facultative means that you can, but you don't have to in order to survive. And some of the things that I think about with respect to freeze tolerance and freeze um, and climate change is all of those things, those few things that have evolved to be able to freeze solid. My big question is, are they obligate? Like, do they have to freeze solid every year in order to survive? Or is it facultative? Can they freeze solid? And so in the context of climate crisis, it might not be as big of a deal, right? It's kind of the difference similar kind of questions about general uh, uh, species that are sort of ge have general diets and those that have very specific diets. Is it obligate or facultative? Kind of like um, dogs versus cats, right? Where dogs are facultative carnivores, but cats are obligate carnivores. Cats must eat meat. Dogs can eat meat. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I have all sorts of questions about that. And I think we're going to get into some of those questions with respect to freeze tolerance the next time. Um, but let's play around with graphs a little bit more. Can we do that for the rest of the... Is that okay? Or do you want to dive right into the wood frog? No. No? Okay. So one of the things that we've been um, talking about a lot is graphing and what you might expect to see. 
um, with differences and stuff. And so what I want to do is I want to play around with graphs a little bit more um, because fun. So imagine you're trying to, dis to determine whether uh, an, an organism or a piece of tissue is freeze tolerant or freeze avoiding. Okay. Um, and what I would like for you to do is let's use, um, I don't know, green. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're looking at a tissue in a microscope or you're looking at, you know, a, a, a very small organism, for example. OK, and over time, um, what I'd love for you to do is you're going to decrease the temperature. So it's going to get cold right over time. Draw for me in green what you would expect to see with respect to uh, ice crystals in the tissue of a freeze tolerant organism. Okay. Cool. That's totally good. Okay. Now let's take, um, I don't know what color, orange, because we haven't used orange yet. Let's imagine an organism that is not freeze tolerant. So it's a freeze avoider that, that does not have antifreeze proteins. So let's draw a freeze avoider that does not have antifreeze proteins. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really good. Sam, something is wrong. <laughs> exactly. Super good. Okay, so let's clean this up a little bit because it's not just one graph that's going to be able to tell you this, right? If I was going to draw out um, who was going to have uh, ice crystals, um, hold on one second, clear, all drawings, um, I, I think I would have a very similar thing, right? So something that is freeze avoiding that does not have antifreeze proteins is also going to go up in ice crystals, but what's going to happen like at a certain point, like right here? <laughs> or maybe even here. What's going to be going on at those points? Yeah. Decrease or... Yeah, Danielle, that's it. Yeah, super good. Okay, yeah. Decrease or dead? Maya, good. Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> Pirates. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so just by looking at the tissue, you may not be able to tell, right? You have to ask the organism, like, talk, 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 are you still alive? Um, and if it's alive and it has ice crystals, then it's freeze tolerant. But you may not even be able to detect that it's alive. It may just look like a little hockey puck. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind that we won't necessarily be able to tell only from a two dimensional graph, you know, what's going on, what strategy that organism is following. Um, is that okay? Confusing? Maybe? Is there anything that you want to graph? Is there anything else that you want to graph? I always like graphing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, totally keep that in mind. Um, we may be able to do it if we if we change um, the y axis to antifreeze proteins. Uh, we may be able to tell the difference between a freeze tolerant and a freeze avoider. Do you want to do that? Let's do that. Let's do uh, on the y axis. If somebody wants to go and just change that to antifreeze protein concentration over time, let's in blue do a freeze tolerant. And in orange, a freeze avoider that uses antifreeze proteins to avoid freezing. Thanks, Danielle. So a freeze tolerant in blue and freeze avoider in orange.
Okay. Thank you for this. Because actually it's swapped the other way. Okay. So freeze a voider in orange doesn't freeze, right? So their antifreeze proteins are going to go up. Okay. Can you delete your own line or your own couple of lines so that we clean up? But we, yeah, thank you. That's great. Okay. And then freeze tolerant here means that they can tolerate freezing and still live, which means they're not trying to antifreeze protein themselves. So go ahead and do that again. And if you're like, I don't understand, pop it in the chat. We will explain. There you go. Yes. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And so, yeah, and the blue would be, the blue line would, would be closer to the bottom, like zero, right? Um, but it doesn't matter. It's not going to change. It's not going to, yeah. Good. Cool. Does that make sense? Are we good with that? Do you have questions? Death, die. It's the last thing I see on the chat. <laughs> Okay, cool. Amazing. Well done. And then, just for fun, we'll end it off with a little ex little um, kind of uh, uh, demonstration of super cooling. So things that super cool do not freeze. They are still liquid, right? But the temperature is really cold. It's below freezing. But the reason why it isn't frozen is for a bunch of different possibilities, right? So the flounder is super cooled. It is below freezing, but it is not frozen because of antifreeze proteins. There are other reasons why, including that you don't have an ice nucleating agent, right? So like pure, pure water needs to have some kind of ice nucleating agent in order to be able to form ice crystals. And so you can actually super cool water uh, below the temperature of freezing if you don't sort of disrupt it to allow it to create uh, crystals. So let's watch. Okay. Can't wait? There it goes. That's a good one. So you can Google these and, and watch them again if you want, but we thought we'd end off with that. And a big thank you to everyone for today. I had a good time. Did you have fun? I had fun. Yay. Okay. Take care, everyone.